essentially, I feel I'm a drug-using, countercultural criminal <laughs> who is trying to go legit. <laughs> and in the process, you're trying to bring psychedelics along as well. And I do like um, the idea of mainstreaming. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I can see how it sounds, you know, in some ways boring and takes away the energy from, you know, oh, we've got the latest, greatest thing. But I, I think it's about mainstreaming our whole selves. It's not about leaving things behind in order to become mainstream. It's about really taking our full selves um, into the heart of the culture and eventually being accepted and appreciated, hopefully. <laughs> and I see it happening, too. Well, along the lines of this countercultural <laughs> criminal, <laughs> I'd like to start by asking about what it was like in the good old days before MDMA was illegal. Um, and yeah, before it was first scheduled and criminalized, how is MDMA use viewed? And could you maybe walk us through briefly the process leading up to the scheduling of MDMA? Because I know you were involved in protesting that. It was the good old days in some ways. And I learned so much from those early days when MDMA was legal that really inspired me to try to um, bring that back. So I was... Um, completely unaware of the psychedelic underground. I had gotten very interested in LSD in 1971 and 72, and I took a lot of LSD and mescaline and <laughs> other things, and that really couldn't handle it, and you know, went to the guidance counselor and uh, college, and the guidance counselor was very sympathetic, actually, and um, handed me this book, uh, Realms of the Human Unconscious by Stan Groff in manuscript copy, and, and that reading that book um, really changed my life because here was science looking at um, states of consciousness, spirituality, and aspects of religion, but focused on healing. And I thought this was absolutely terrific. I had become aware of LSD shortly after the backlash. I didn't really appreciate it when it was happening during the 60s, I believe the propaganda. When I learned about MDMA, it was 1982. It was at Esalen, I was doing a month-long workshop with Stan Groff. A woman, Debbie Harlow, came by with MDMA, and she started talking about how there was this new drug, and it helped people feel love, and it helped people feel connection, and help people talk to others. And I thought, you know, how boring. Uh, <laughs> you know, I feel love, I feel fine, and you know, I'm used to psychedelics. You know you've done enough when you can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, you know, but of course I was um, just barely smart enough to buy some anyway. <laughs> uh, and then I went home and, and uh, did it with my girlfriend and it was astonishing. It was so profound. And so I felt this tremendous opportunity that I had woken up to LSD um, after it was criminalized, after the research was sh shut down. But I woke up to MDMA when it was still legal. But at, in 1982, I was still a little bit late to the party. I mean, it had been developed around 75, 76. Leo Zeff, who's in that picture, was the leader of the um, underground psychedelic psychotherapy movement. He worked with Sasha Shulgin and Ann Shulgin. And when they would have new drugs that they thought would be valuable, they would turn it over to Leo. And he came out of retirement to work with MDMA. Um, but it was also being sold at the time as ecstasy already. And it was clear that it was doomed because whenever these drugs are being used in public settings, this was during the Nancy Reagan escalation of the drug war and just say no, um, it was clear that there was going to be this conflict inevitably. The MDMA was being distributed under the code name Adam. It wasn't connected to the chemical nature of it. Leo, through his work, introduced it to hundreds of psychiatrists and psychotherapists, and they used it in their practices, spread it to other people, and it was one of these other people that took it in this context that thought, aha, you know, there's a bigger market here and I could make, you know, fortune, and people need this drug. I thought, this is an opportunity to get involved to try to protect it for this inevitable crackdown. And having it be legal was absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's, you know, we think we're immune to a lot of propaganda, but it's incredible the number of people that have talked to me about MDMA causing holes in the brain because they've seen the slides from Oprah and from MTV. 
and all of this neurotoxicity concerns that just, you know, kind of wear on you in the background in some ways. So there was none of that. This was just this fresh new drug that had people talking about how much it opened them up to love and to connection. And it felt um, so healing. And there was different people, myself included, that had had challenging LSD experiences during the 60s or 70s. And MDMA helped to integrate, even after a decade or more, those challenging experiences. So we were able to communicate to other people about this drug and they were more willing to listen because it was legal and because there wasn't this kind of propaganda about how dangerous it was. So the best example for me uh, to, to explain to you now what it meant was there was a book in 1983 by Robert Mueller, uh, New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. He was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And he wrote this book about how we need mysticism. The idea was mysticism is the antidote to fundamentalism and that psychedelics can produce this sense of connection. It goes beyond the ego and then we see we're all the same and then how do we hate Muslims or how do we hate people that are different color or how do we trash nature? I wrote him a letter and said, great book, you didn't say anything about psychedelics, but um, you know, there's MDMA, it's still legal and it has the spiritual potential. There's the Good Friday experiment and every new way of killing gets unlimited money. So how about uh, helping us restart psychedelic research? and protect MDMA. So he said, um, well, first off, he wrote me back, which was astonishing. I, I was just like a college undergraduate. And he said, I understood his book. I understood what he was trying to say. And he said, um, here's a bunch of religious professionals that would be interested in hearing from you. Of course, I read between the lines, and I heard him say, send them MDMA. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Zalman Schachter, Brother David Steindl-Rost, Vanya Palmer, experts in Zen meditation, Christian mysticism, Jewish mysticism, and of course, I sent them MDMA because it was legal. They didn't have to worry about it. And then they took some as aid to meditation in different ways. Zalman talked about MDMA being like the Sabbath. We were having meetings at Esalen and there was um, to, to plan the defense. And there was one meeting that was pretty crucial with Terence McKenna. Uh, Terence was talking about how if it's from nature, it's good, and if it's from the lab, it's bad and MDMA is from the lab, and we should go with things that have thousands of years of, of history. And um, I was like, Terrence, that's so ridiculous. <laughs> you know, we're part of nature, our minds are part of nature, and I said, let's, uh, I'll put up some money, Let, let's do a first secret underground MDMA study to get some safety data for when it would be time for the crackdown, then we'd have some safety data. And Dick Price, who's the co-founder of Esalen, put up some money, and before you know it, we were able to conduct a a secret study and keeping the data private until the time would come for us, us to um, challenge the DEA with it. So that, that all of these things could be taking place in this legal context. And so it, it was just this remarkable opportunity. And then in the summer of 1984 is when the DEA decided to criminalize MDMA. They did not hear at all of the word of, MD, of, of MDMA. They'd never even heard of um, Adam. They just heard of ecstasy. And so that's what really motivated them to try to crack down. At the time, there was only eight uh, emergency room visits. Nobody had died. There was, it, the problem was there were no problems. <laughs> Here's a drug that loads of people are doing and there's, they seem to be benefiting from that. And that's kind of counter to what the drug war was about. So. There came time for the, these hearings, and we were able to get people from all walks of life, uh, Harvard Medical School, Lester Grinspoon, others, to testify for us because they could talk about it when they had these experiences, when it was legal. So it was this golden moment of experimentation and communication throughout the culture that kind of collided with the repressive nature of the drug war. We were slowing the DEA down in the DEA administrative law judge hearings in the US, I became aware of the fact that they were moving internationally to criminalize MDMA through the WHO, the World Health Organization. And in one of the most remarkable synchronicities, it turned out that the committee, the expert committee at the WHO that was reviewing the data from MDMA and a bunch of other drugs as to whether to recommend that they be criminalized was Stan Groff's brother. 
Paul Groff was a prominent psychiatrist in Canada, focused a lot on depression, and he was the chair of the committee that would evaluate MDMA. And I arranged through Robert Mueller for me to go to uh, WHO. He helped me to meet up with the um, scientific advisors and the expert of this expert committee, and we presented some information. And then um, the committee voted to criminalize MDMA, everybody but Paul voted to criminalize MDMA, and Paul was able to get this very little um, asterisk, a footnote, saying that the uh, chairman of the committee voted against criminalization because he thought it would inhibit research, and they put in this little paragraph that said, um, the nations of the world encourage uh, more research into this most interesting substance. And that was like, in a way, an overall defeat, but we got this one little footnote that was used later by the Swiss government to justify opening up MDMA from 88 to uh, 93. So, uh, you know, how do you see, you've just been uh, representing MAPS and representing the psychedelic community with the uh, United Nations General Assembly Special Section on Drug Policy. So w what is your sense of what's going on internationally? UN General Assembly Special Session on the World Drug Problem is what it's <laughs> called. It was the first time in 20 years that the UN General Assembly had met to revisit international drug treaties. And 20 years ago, the mission was for a drug-free world. The drugs have just increased. <laughs> It was an interesting time to reassess. On one hand, it was definitely a bit disappointing that despite the fact the drug war is so clearly failing, um, the general movement of the UN and different countries represented there was kind of perpetuating this drug war rhetoric generally, though you know they did incorporate some a bit of um, progress. But for me, what was um, really inspiring about these meetings was that it pulled together um, human rights and drug policy activists from all around the world. And that was a really um, empowering part of this, this work to connect with people doing work in all different countries and learning more closely about what's happening um, and how we can all work together to ultimately influence the UN, hopefully, because, you know, progress is made by individual countries trying innovative things and reforming, and then that ultimately impacts the UN. Um, the UN is not really the body that's most innovative and kind of leading the way, but kind of following. Um, but I guess, you know, generally the focus at this drug summit, I can't say it was on psychedelics. Um, you know, a big focus was about ending capital punishment for drug crimes, which, you know, with what's going on in the Philippines right now with this uh, you know, mass murder of drug dealers, we see how urgent and, and crisis-oriented a lot of, and reactionary drug policy um, has to be sometimes. But um, some research that I was actually surprised to find was that according to the WHO, MDMA is actually the third most used illicit substance in the world after cannabis and amphetamines. So that was a really... Um, <laughs> interesting piece to be speaking about in this context when um, many of the drug policy activists were really focused on moving away from a criminalization of dr and drug war approach to a public health and harm reduction oriented approach. Um, so speaking about psychedelic harm reduction in the broader spectrum of harm reduction work, I think was really important. And likewise for us to kind of stand in solidarity with the broader drug policy movement working in all forms of harm reduction. Um, and I guess speaking globally of, of other countries, they're certainly leading the way in psychedelic harm reduction, unfortunately, beyond the US. Um, I was recently in Barcelona, um, where the Spanish government actually pays for something called energy control, which is a drug testing space. So I visited this space where people send in their drugs. You can send in your MDMA for a really affordable price. And it's so affordable that people from the U.S. actually send their drugs to Barcelona <laughs> to get tested. Um, and yeah, and the government sends back the results. They also had government created like um, snorting straws and all different <laughs> harm reduction tools, which was just so shocking to try to imagine the U.S. government funding something like that, let alone allowing that to happen. Um, because currently, under the so-called RAVE Act, many 
um, venues and places are afraid of even allowing harm reduction measures to happen because they don't want to be held liable under this law for letting drug use happen on that, their premises. But um, we had some exciting progress with that this year at Burning Man, finally. <laughs> um, the Zendo Project, which is MAP's psychedelic harm reduction um, project, was finally kind of officially recognized by Burning Man and, and each person attending Burning Man, Burning Man got um, information about the Zendo and their greeter packet. So that was really a huge progress, but you know, still absolutely no drug testing you know, permitted at Burning Man and there's a long way to go and we have a lot to learn from different countries like Portugal that's also decriminalized and at Boom they've had psychedelic harm reduction really well integrated for a long time. My job I feel is to be perpetually dissatisfied. Once I'm happy then that means somebody else should lead maps. <laughs> After we had the Burning Man organization tell 70,000 people about Zendo, the leader of our Zendo team, Sarah Gale, gave a presentation to the Bureau of Land Management, 60 federal police police heard about Zendo and were sympathetic with it. Um, and so I was sitting around thinking, okay, what's next? What, what do we do next? And so now we're going to be applying to the DEA for a special license to set up a drug testing program at Burning Man. Yeah. Um, uh, I, next year. <laughs> that it was Biden that put in this Rave Act, reducing America's vulnerability to ecstasy. We had this all-night Burning Man event on the Washington, D.C. Mall. Several days after that, Natalie, you went to see uh, Biden's staff. Yes. So going from um, right outside the White House, dancing all night, and then protesting the drug war. So what was it like when you went to um, see Biden's staff? Um, unfortunately, they weren't even really familiar with the Rave Act and like the <laughs> negative repercussions that it was having, which was quite frustrating. Um, and I can't say that they were really that interested in engaging as much as I would have hoped, but I do have more hope that um, in this Amend the Rave Act campaign, um, I work with Stephanie Jones from Drug Policy Alliance and Dee Dee Goldsmith, um, whose senator is Senator Kane, who actually has been supportive of this process and sent a letter to the DEA kind of asking um, in support of amending the Rave Act. So that was pretty encouraging that we kind of have this connection to the current vice president, hopefully <laughs> the next vice president, and what are some of the implications of rescheduling and descheduling? Like how would that impact medical access, legal access, harm reduction? Descheduling means legalization. Rescheduling means changing it um, from schedule one to some other schedule so that it's actually a prescription medicine. And so I think that we need to work on parallel tracks. So descheduling is something that um, we're anticipating will take place around um, 2035. <laughs> um, what we're going to, we're anticipating um, MDMA becomes a medicine around 2021. Um, if our negotiations with FDA go well, we have a meeting on November 29th coming up with FDA about the phase two, phase three transition. And if it goes well, then we anticipate 2021, also the same, similar dates probably for psilocybin, and then we have probably um, 10 years of setting up psychedelic clinics throughout the United States and Europe, and then people get more comfortable with uh, the whole concept of beneficial uses of psychedelics in psychotherapy, and the clinics expand to become places where people can um, bring their families for sessions, and then beyond that, the country gets comfortable with marijuana legalization, which will maybe be somewhere like 2022 or so. It's kind of race. Does marijuana get legal federally or does MDMA or psilocybin become a medicine first? And the path is really the path trod by big pharma. I mean, we have to acknowledge that the, and I do, that the scientific method is crucial, that we lie to ourselves all the time and we see what we want to see and we need the scientific method and we need to do the research according to the FDA standards. And I think that that's achievable. We have support from within FDA to do the studies. The key point to understand about rescheduling is that what we're talking about is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. It's really about the psychotherapy. So the drug is never gonna be a take home drug. 
There's all sorts of ways in which the FDA can regulate how drugs become medicines. We're not talking about MDMA becomes a medicine or psilocybin becomes a medicine and anybody can prescribe it. It'll be only people with certain kind of training and then only in certain kind of clinic settings and only for administration under direct supervision. And that's the vision that we have for the rescheduling. It's probably going to be about $25 million. We have almost half of that already raised or pledged. So I think it's within reach, and I think there's such a need in society for this kind of healing that we will be able to uh, make it happen. Legitimizing uh, and obtaining approval for prescription use of psychedelics, how does that relate to social justice? So MDMA and psychedelic therapy um, is so effective because it encourages the individual to address you know, the root source of their trauma and their issue um, beyond just their symptoms. And often in, in really trying to examine the root cause, um, broader kind of social um, causes of trauma and pain start to come into the picture. Um, I've had the privilege of watching hours of um, MDMA therapy tapes from MAPS. Um, and I was really struck by how so many veterans who are recounting their trauma from war often recounted tra the trauma of perpetration and of committing violence. And that was really what was coming up for people. Um, and there's this one woman that really sticks in my head who I remember like crying out like, I had to kill those children, I had to kill those children, they were coming at us. And then right after saying, how could I have been a part of something where I was forced to kill children? And kind of really starting to question the violence um, of war and, and, and the greater causes and systems that are forcing her to be a part of that. Are we helping inadvertently to make it easier to wage war? Or is there some dark side of what we're doing? And, and how do yeah, you view I, that? I also get asked that and also asked why we do work in Israel also with veterans and I receive a lot of questions like that. Um, and I think part of this healing process is also about um, healing your fear, you know, and when you're in these states of violence, you're acting out of fear and protection. Um, so I think healing is a really essential part in stopping cycles of violence and stopping fear. And I think really the only way to move forward and move towards peace is healing on kind of both sides and not just the so-called victims, but recognizing that all often the oppressors and perpetrators are experiencing a lot of trauma themselves that inspire them to act out of fear and, and, and you know, perpetuate violence. So I think it's really essential to stop these, these cycles of violence um, to heal. And beyond um, the trauma from war, which um, you know, is something that we, we speak about often in the context of veterans, I think what we often don't really recognize is that the great trauma that stems from social injustice in general. Um, and actually there's greater um, percentages of people suffering from PTSD in marginalized communities, um, from you know, suffering from oppressions like racism, sexism, homophobia, poverty. Um, they're actually higher rates than in returning war veterans often. And um, to, to recognize that and to recognize there's um, a researcher named Dr. Monica Williams who's doing some pioneer work, pioneering work on PTSD from racism. Um, she actually attended a MAPS MDMA therapy study and wrote a piece for our bulletin if you're interested in hearing more about that. Um, but I think just you know, to take the example of racial trauma um, and to think about what Black Lives Matter in this country means today, the fact that there needs to be a movement asserting you know, that black lives matter is a response to a very traumatic feeling that black lives don't matter. And I mean, the combination of intergenerational trauma, starting from slavery to Jim Crow to segregation to our current systems of mass incarceration and police violence, you know, compounding that with the current state of being, you know, a person of color and turning on the news and seeing someone shot by the police for no reason and just the different levels of trauma that that creates really does also manifest an in individual PTSD. So in that way, I see a lot of potential in um, psychedelic healing and addressing these greater social injustices and helping us recognize the harms. There was an incredible article in the journal Cell 
which is one of the most highly rated, the highest impact uh, factor journals in the scientific literature. And this was July 14th of um, 2016. And it was by two neuroscientists from Stanford. And they said, we have to unleash the entire range of techniques of modern neuroscience to study mechanisms of action of MDMA. And the last two sentences were something that Natalie or, or I could have written ourselves because it was saying basically the world needs more compassion and empathy and the study of MDMA is one small step to get us towards that goal. So it was just so totally heartening to see this coming from mainstream neuroscience and they recognize that this is um, an avenue to try to help um, you know, with multi-generational trauma, with all these things, that, that that's why for me, we've made a fundamental alliance with the drug policy reform movement, because the kind of healing that we need, and when we talk about uh, the current political climate, it's really not about Trump, uh, you know, but it's about millions and millions of people who are vulnerable to having their fears and anxieties be triggered by things that he is saying. And so we have to have broad-based mental health with millions of people beyond just clinically treating conditions, and that's why I think we have to go beyond uh, legalization. But a lot of the people who go to war are actually people of color. And yet, in our studies, we have not had a single African American in our study. We've had over a thousand people volunteer for 24 spots in our study of veterans, firefighters, and police officers, and we've not been able to really get one African American. And I, and I wonder why you think that might be and what we can do about that but I could guess there's a really long history in this country of research and experimentation on black people in particular, um, you know, injecting people with syphilis and doing really horrific things. So I think there's a lot of reason for the black community to have a lot of mistrust over some new innovative kind of crazy therapy that works with your brain. You know, I think um, there's a big need to, to proactively reach out to communities and educate and talk about our work and not just expect that you know they'll come. Um, and on top of that, I think, I've spoken to many people of color who've had really difficult experiences with therapists who don't quite understand their experiences of trauma. Um, and so I think it's also really important that we work with therapists who are conscious of these issues that are also people of color or not, or not, but who are really engaged with these issues to provide a safe space for people of color going through our research when they are, you know, like examining all of their trauma. It's really important to provide the safest space possible. I wanted to share a harm reduction story that I personally witnessed 2007 or 8 at Burning Man when I was also working on the harm reduction team there with MAPS and other collaborators. There was someone who was severely agitated on the verge of becoming violent, surrounded by basically a circle of law enforcement officers who were ready to tase and zip tie this person. There was a woman who was working with the harm reduction unit who very slowly and gently approached this person, step by step, conversational voice, infinite patience, very slow, very kind, very non-confrontational. And it must have taken six or seven or eight minutes of getting this person back down to a place where they were just comfortable and could be spoken with. And afterwards, this ring of law enforcement people were just amazed. And they asked, are you a therapist? Is there a way we can do this? Is it a hypnosis technique? And her response was, just try being nice to people. <laughs> Kevin Baltic. <laughs> Kevin. Thank you. Yeah. We should all look around and look how white this room is. We have to be more proactive and reach out, as in a lot of the ways that Natalie was saying. And I think we have to um, suggest to people that we are able to sensitively work with them, that their trauma goes way deep and that um, we need special outreach. Uh, you know, we, we now, um, I went to one of the whitest places. I was up on top of a mountain. There's a group called Summit that has um, discussions, and so they have a mountain out in, in Utah. So I was uh, giving a talk at the top of this mountain in the middle of a whiteout with snow all around, and there was this um, African-American female psychiatrist, uh, Stephanie Stewart, who uh, was interested in this area, and so now we've, um, encouraged her. She's gone through our training. So we're going to try to have more bridges 
you know, active bridges between marginalized communities and what we're doing. The FDA basically wants your phase three studies to look like America. They want it to be racially diverse, gender balanced. We're gonna have to make a special effort to figure that out. I would be really interested down the line in seeing how group work might be effective in, in a population like that is traumatized by kind of more of a group trauma. Um, I think that that could be a really interesting um, mode of, of doing that work. And I know kind of one of the questions that was gonna get cut off that was also similar to what you're asking is about the accessibility of MDMA therapy in general. We're gonna have about 10 phase three sites and one of them we're trying to negotiate right now with Kaiser in California and Oakland. MDMA therapy or psilocybin therapy, it's very labor intensive. And so it's initially more expensive than just giving somebody a pharmacological pill every day. But over time, you know, the pills don't work as well and they add up as well. But how are we gonna get insurance companies to cover it? And so if we can um, add to our protocols, a, um, and we're now designing these instruments that are gonna look at healthcare utilization expenses, because people with PTSD, utilize healthcare more frequently than people without PTSD. They have anxiety, they have all sorts of somatic symptoms from the stress and the tension. So we're gonna be hopefully aligning ourselves with Kaiser and they're gonna have tracked the people's healthcare utilization with PTSD before they get into the study and then after. So I, I think it's our challenge is to try to figure out how to make alliances with insurance companies. And, and also just in terms of access, um, I met yesterday with um, Lori Sutton, who's a, a retired Brigadier General, who's the highest ranking psychiatrist in the U.S. Army, and she's head of veterans, uh, the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs for the city of New York. And we were talking about uh, the latest statistics that just came out that we received from the VA. As of June 30th um, of this year, 868,000 veterans are receiving disability payments for PTSD. There's another 600,000 for other major mental illnesses like uh, depression and anxiety. And just for PTSD, it costs in the neighborhood of $15 billion a year. And when we think about the cost of war, uh, these are mostly young people and this is gonna be on for decades to come. So there's a financial incentive for the Department of Defense and the VA as well. We haven't yet persuaded them <laughs> that that responsibility should extend to funding MDMA research, but I think that we will see the opportunity to get insurance companies involved and it will be accessible and hopefully we will develop a, a broader base of people that are comfortable coming. But I think that is one of our major challenges is we have to proactively do that. And actually to add to, to hopefully facilitating that, um, um, Ismail Ali, who has just started working with me in the policy team on MAPS, um, is interested in developing a group called POC, Psychonauts of Color. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we're hopeful. Um, there are actually this has been a kind of amazing network developed over the last few years of psychedelic societies around the world and around the US. Um, right now our list is over 80 societies wow. from Pakistan to Czech Republic, you know, to all yeah. over the US, to the South even. Um, so I think these groups are really important in helping changing culture um, in their communities. So I'm hopeful that with a group like Psychonauts of Color, that could yeah. also help cultivate a safer space for people of color to talk about psychedelics, maybe learn about MAPS's research, and go from there. <laughs>of all the psychedelics is the most inherently therapeutic on its own. And we get a lot of people come to us and say, I took MDMA at a rave or I took it at Burning Man and I healed myself. Because we're again, nonprofit drug development, the treatment manual that describes our therapeutic method, it's posted for free on the website. The trainings that we do at Burning Man and elsewhere involve hundreds of people that we're training. This year there was over 200 volunteers and they're able, you know, within a, a few hours, both, you know, kind of what Kevin said, just to be nice to people, but also to learn about uh, a little bit about how to work with psychedelics with people that a lot of people, um, you know, who aren't formally psychotherapists are able to be profoundly helpful to people having a difficult trip. 
And so I, I think the peer-to-peer -peer approach um, really has a lot of merit. And it's also, one of the things that we know from psychotherapy outcome research is that the key factor is the therapeutic alliance. It's the trust between the therapist and the patient. It's not the school of therapy that they practice that matters, but it's really that trust. And when you have a situation with friends that you trust, a lot of times people can open up in, in certain ways. And, and that is a way to you know, provide it at virtually no cost and to help a large number of people. But if we have these clinic settings and train therapists for people that that isn't enough, then I think we'll be able to cover way more people. And I'll say that group work is also a form of peer oh. counseling, and that's really effective in both psychedelic settings and even integration after. So I think it would be really interesting to see even with individual um, psychedelic therapy how we might be able to use group work and peer work to help integrate um, after and, and continue supporting. Yeah, we're, we're making some steps towards that group work too. So that our first study in collaboration with VA-affiliated therapists, but we're funding it, it's taking place outside of the VA, is a, a therapy that was developed, a non-drug therapy called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. Conjoint meaning couples. And so it's couples therapy where one member of the couple has PTSD and it affects the relationship. And we were able to get permission from the FDA, from the DEA, from the IRB to give both members of the couple MDMA, not just the person with PTSD. And we've run the first couple already. So that's the first time since Rick Strassman got approval for DMT research in 1990 that more than one person has been able to be dosed at the same time. And there's a team at, uh, at Johns Hopkins that's talking about trying to do a project with a group with MDMA, not um, patients, but at least initially with healthy volunteers and see what happens when you do physiological measurements and other safety measures to to um, administer MDMA to a group of people at one time. And we know, of course, that the ayahuasca circles and the peyote Native American church, all of those are group settings. Rick Doblin and Natalie Ginsberg, thank you very, very much. Thank you for joining us. Yes. <laughs> great. Amazing. That went so fast.